Hi friends, my name is Susie. I live in the Midwest part of the United States. I am a wife, mother, brand new mother-in-law. I'm a sister, daughter, auntie, and friend. I'm also a licensed professional counselor and a certified health and wellness coach. I have no family history of neurological disorders, yet in 2020, when you were all thinking about COVID, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Looking back, I can trace my earliest symptoms to my late 20s, early 30s when I was a young mom. And, you know, I had two little babies. I was changing poopy diapers all the time. And I used to joke that my nose just had enough of that, went on vacation, shut down, never came back. And at that point, my husband became the designated nose for our family, which he absolutely hates. The poor guy has the most sensitive, sensitive smeller. And I'm the one who's always pulling something out of the fridge that's maybe a little questionable and going, hey, hon, will you smell this? He takes a big whiff and gets a nose full of some rotten food smell. And the poor guy, he's like, oh, I can't believe you can't smell that. And I can't believe I fell for it again. And the last time he was like, don't ever ask me to smell another thing. If it's questionable, just throw it out. Who knew that losing your sense of smell or having changes in your ability to distinguish smells was an indicator of Parkinson's disease? I had no idea. You can tell the people what it's like to live with a person who can't smell rotten food. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> Seriously. Just get ready to gag often. Here, smell this. It looks, it's growing stuff, but can you see it? You don't really need your, your smell. You can just actually use your eyes and say that that brownish green slime on top of the milk is enough to sort of say, maybe it's time to throw it away. But no, let's get my loved one who, you know, I just want to fool and go, hey, smell this chicken that looks like it's starting to grow things on top of it. And should we eat it or not? Yeah, that's what it's like. It's a great way to lose weight. <laughs> so that's my husband. He's hilarious and he's a lot of fun. But he doesn't like to smell rotten food. I guess that makes sense. I don't know. Now, where were we before we got so rudely interrupted? I think I was talking about my diagnostic journey. And all I really wanted to say about that is it wasn't a straight line. I started having tremors and I was told I had benign essential tremors and that Parkinson's had been ruled out. Nine years later, we moved, which caused us to switch insurance and switch doctors. My new doctor said, I think I'm seeing signs of Parkinson's. And that was not at all what I wanted to hear. In fact, I was completely blindsided by that because it had been ruled out several years ago. So it wasn't on my radar at all. The news hit me hard. I felt like I was reeling. My mind was just spinning. It went all over the place, all kinds of emotions, all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of questions. The grieving process took time, but eventually I found my grounding and found my footing and made a way forward for myself. Everything about this disease is demotivating. And that's really what I wanted to talk about today because I feel like and maybe this is the therapist in me, you know, if this is my seat on the bus, so to speak. But everything I hear about Parkinson's, probably, maybe that's not fair, maybe it's more like 80 or 90%, is really focused on the physical aspects of our disease, and right, rightfully so. This is a very physical movement disorder. We need to talk about our symptoms. We need to talk about the brain. We need to talk about disease management. But what's often missing is this idea of motivation. And motivation is tied to values and vision. The conundrum with Parkinson's, it's like the conundrum on top of the problem with Parkinson's, 
is that in order to have a vision that's compelling enough to get me out of bed in the morning, I have to think about the future. Yet everything that I read or hear about my disease paints a picture of an inevitable future I don't want to face. If I must have a motivation strong enough to propel me beyond the demotivating effects of my disease, and that motivation is compelled by a vision of the future, yet I have a disease that everything I hear about, read about, everything I, that's told to me paints a picture of an inevitable future that I want to avoid, I'm stuck. Does that even make sense? I feel like... <laughs> I'm not even expressing myself well. Well, we can blame that on Parkinson's too, right? Of course. The conundrum on top of the problem is that I have to have motivation to do what I need to do to fight my disease. Motivation is tied to a positive view of the future. Everything I hear and see about this disease paints a picture of an inevitable future that I want to avoid. I don't even want to think about where I'll be 10 years from now because what I'm told is this is going to progress. It's going to be worse. My tomorrows are sort of gray. We are like fish swimming upstream and the current is taking us to a place we do not want to go, which kind of reminds me of a story about my, my nephew Jackson. Last fall, last November, he was at the beach playing volleyball with some friends. And he, he heard a commotion in the water. He looked out and he saw three men exhausted and looking like they were about to drown. People were screaming, help them, help them. And he's the only one who ran into the water, grabbed a boogie board and swam out to the men. He said he made eye contact with the men right before one of them went down for the last time. He dove down found the man, pulled him back up, and led the three men to safety. And I was like, Jackson, how did you do that? You're a hero. And he goes, no, I'm not Uncle Suze. It's simple. You just got to swim sideways. And I'm like, well, first of all, I should explain why he calls me Uncle Suze. Um, <laughs> when the kids were little, they got a little confused between auntie and uncle. So I became Uncle Suze and it stuck and I really don't mind at all. It's sweet. So Uncle Suze, you just gotta swim sideways. And I'm like, what do you mean, Jack? And he goes, well, if you're in a riptide, you can't swim against the tide, it's too strong. You have to swim sideways along the shore and get out of the current. And then you just swim right in. It's simple. Well, how does swimming sideways apply to Parkinson's disease? What? How do we? How are we going to circle back on this one? Most people think the way to fight this disease is to just try harder. And I'm saying I think we need to learn how to swim sideways. Swimming sideways means finding our why. We have to tap into a deeper motivation, a value of some kind that is so dear to our heart, we can't not do it. And the people I see, well, okay, I should say, as a therapist, I am a professional listener, not a professional speaker. I'm a professional ear. So I pay attention to what people are saying. And some of the things I've heard are stories like, well, it all changed for me one day when I was walking down the stairs carrying my infant son. My foot froze and I almost fell down the stairs with my baby. What's the deeper value there? My child's safety and my deep love for my, my baby boy. Another person said, well, it all changed for me the day I realized I want to celebrate my 50th wedding anniversary by dancing with the love of my life. That one hits home for me. I mean, even as I tell those stories, I'm fighting back tears because it's tapping into something that's so deep in my heart that I can't help but get emotional. My why is obviously tied to my love for my family. 
I know my disease is gonna be hard on them no matter what, but I'm doing what I can do to have the best future possible. And my girls are in their young 20s, so when they're older and life's curveballs hit them, I may or may not be around to coach them through that. But one thing they're gonna have is my example. At some point I realized my disorder, if nothing else, gives me the opportunity to demonstrate and show them how to handle adversity. And that fuels my motivation to do all the things I do every day. My walking, my stretching, my golfing, my tapping, everything that I do is connected to those whys. I think there's a lot of people out there who are fighting against the tide and think the answer is to just try harder. And I'm gonna tell you, the answer is to swim sideways. You gotta have a hold of your why. You might even ask, why did you bother to make this video today? I mean, that took time and energy. You could have been doing something else. Well, sure. But I wanna be like my nephew Jackson, that when I see people who are tired and exhausted because they're fighting against the current, I wanna run in, make eye contact and say, follow me. And I believe the way forward is to find what motivates you to the deepest core of your being. Whether it's your love for your family, someone's counting on you, or you're the kind of person that says, I'm gonna be in a tr clinical trial because my suffering is gonna help someone else. Those altruistic, higher order, Values are the things that are going to keep us putting one foot in front of the other. In closing, I just want to say to you, may you experience grace and peace and joy and find your why so that you can have the best life possible and live brave. Thank you for listening. I hope it helps.